Hello, my friends. I'm Father Nelson Medina, broadcasting from Colombia, South America. And this is Your Catholic Faith Reloaded, episode number 11. I'm your host. And so far in this program, we have been talking about uh, the revelation of God, coming to know God. How do we come to know God? And the answer to that uh, implies to enter into a relationship. That's the very basic concept. It is not just examining like a microbe under the scrutiny of a microscope. It is entering into a relationship. But that relationship, we are not in need of imagining because it did happen. And that's the story of the elected people, the people of God. And the story of that relationship is exactly what we have in the Bible. So the Bible is the main, uh, the, the central way, the main road we have to come to know God, the Bible. Now, these people of God did not vanish when Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, come to this earth as it is as it was foretold in the Bible, and is also told in the New Testament, the life, the works, and the sorrowful passion of our Lord. All that is very well told as a testimony in the New Testament. But when Jesus came to this earth, the people of God did not vanish. May I insist in that point, on that point, and the, the important thing here is that the new people of God is exactly the church. So the many things that the people of God knew did not disappear with the presence of Christ, but they reached, so to speak, a climax. That's the fullness of revelation. And then we know that Jesus Christ promised the presence of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, that will guide the church and will uh, come to a fullness, the teaching that the Lord himself had, uh, had given to us. That's the, the meaning of tradition. Tradition is not a dead thing. It is a living, it's a living thing. It is the transmission itself the transmission of faith within the people of God. And that entails, of course, concrete people. So you can find characters, as you find in the New Testament, people like St. Paul or St. Peter. Okay, so along the journey of the centuries, you find the very, very special people who reflected heavily, and very deeply on these subjects. And their writings are a very, very important to us. And you have also the councils. And all that is the tradition of the church. Now, the church, the new people of God, was, from the very beginning, it, it was a, a high, hierarchical body, in the sense that the apostles had full authority over that body of Christ, over that, on, on that people, over that people <clears throat> that the Lord had chosen and had prepared for himself. It is exactly the same in the church. So we have our bishops who are the successors of the apostles. And at the head of the body of the bishops, we have the Pope. But let's go, let's move on step by step. And now we know that we have the Bible, the book of the people of God. We have tradition, which is a living tradition and entails the, the, the life, the teachings, the liturgy, the morals that accompany and, that, and give shape to, to, to the people of God in the sense of living according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we have the magisterium. And the magisterium 
is the is, is another word for the power and the authority that the apostles and the successors of the apostles have in the church. So that's the point we have reached at this time. And the next step is to approach a very important thing, which is, well, why was necessary? Why was necessary all this uh, journey, all this revelation, all this story? Why was it necessary? And the reason for that necessarily, may I repeat myself, the reason for that is exactly in a very short word we have in English, sin. It is because of sin. In reality, we cannot elude in the sense that we find sin, sin in ourselves and we, have, we find a sin in the world all around us. And in some sense, that the Bible, the entire Bible, is the story of overcoming sin. If we were to give a subtitle to the Bible, that would be a good one. The Bible, subtitle, overcoming sin. Sin will not have the final word. That's the message of the Bible. Sin will not have the last word. It's not the end of the story. Okay, so let's let, let's go to a very uh, beautiful resource that we have found, and I always mention my source. That resource is a sort of catechism that was made publicly available by the Joan of Arc Catholic Parish in Indianapolis. Thank you to them. Sin and grace. Be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. This is a sort of general commandment that we find in the book of Leviticus. This is one of the first books in the Bible. You have Genesis, Exodus, and then Leviticus. This particular sentence, this particular commandment, is in chapter 19, verse 2. Be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. God is holy, and whatever is not holy is unacceptable to him. God is the source, source of all life. Therefore, whatever is contrary to God's will leads to death. Wow, this is a very simple but very powerful reasoning. God is holy, and whatever is not holy is unacceptable to him. At the same time, God is the source of all life. Therefore, whatever is contrary to God's will leads to death. God did not create death. Death is the result of disobedience to God. This disobedience we call sin. It's like taking distance from God, renouncing his ways, turning our back to God. That's sin. Sin is an offense against God's will, against the natural order of creation, and against divine revelation. Here you find three dimensions of sin. It is an offense against God's will and against God himself, which is very important to, to say and to underline because in our time, it is very frequent that people see sin only as a horizontal thing, so to speak. So if I 
offend someone, if I take something that is not my own, well, that's clearly a sin. But at its very essence, sin is connected to offending God. Sin is an offense against God's will, against the natural order of creation, the natural order of creation. And I find this so inspiring because when we go, when we go against the natural order of creation, that does not make us different from what we are creatures. We are creatures. So think of that. You are a creature. So you're part of creation. And you are in rebellion against the natural order of creation. You see where I'm heading to? You see? If you are in rebellion against the natural order of creation and you are creation, okay, what's the deduction? You're going against yourself. You're destroying yourself. So sin goes against God. And in that sense, every sin is contrary to God's will and to God's wonderful dispensation of love and goodness. But at the same time, if you are going against creation and you are creation, you're part of the creation of God, you're going against yourself. Of course, as we will see in our next program, hopefully, sin sells itself, so to speak, as an affirmation and as conquering, conquering freedom, autonomy, sovereignty. It's all the contrary. You're going against yourself. You're destroying the best part of yourself. You're fighting against your best dreams, your best hopes, and your best goals. Sin is an offense against God's will, against the natural order of creation, and against divine revelation. To go against revelation means that the very means that make us capable of receiving knowledge and embracing knowledge about who God is, we are losing. So it's all about darkness. It's all about obscurity. It's a perpetual night. Is voluntary blindness. That's sin. And now we understand. Now we understand that it is so important. This battle, this war against sin. And, and I, I hope that you now appreciate the subtitle that I proposed, the Bible, overcoming sin. Now we understand that sin is a serious thing. Many people avoid or try to avoid speaking of sin. The reasons are not to be told at this time. But you know, we do that omission at our, our own risk. 
and we get damaged. Okay, we finished this brief lesson or, or this brief part of a lesson with this suggestion. Read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and to 19, and then some questions describe the progression of events which led to the original sin. What are the results of sin as described in this passage from Genesis? What is our hope as sinners, according to first letter of St. John, chapter 1, verses 8 to 10? So now we have one homework. We should go to Genesis chapter 3, and I kindly invite you to read the text by yourself and to answer these questions. I'm sure that most spiritual, abundant spiritual prophet will come to your life. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for being here. And do not forget your Catholic faith reloaded. God bless.